Judy, you're muted. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. I'm Judy Miller uh, here at ERM Protect Cybersecurity Solutions in Coral Gables. I'll be moderating today on behalf of Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar. Today, we're going to talk about how to battle the ransomware threat effectively and without getting into legal trouble. The session will last about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, with plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, we'd like to start with a shout out to Jonathan, who you see there on your screen, Israel, at the Florida Bar Association's Legal Fuel Division, uh, which provides resources for practitioners uh, and small law firms. Uh, and, and feel free to reach out to Jonathan to learn more about their resources. Uh, they're uh, the sponsors of today's event and they've arranged for the CLE credits. Uh, you can claim a total of one CLE for either general, technical, or legal, log into your bar profile and report the credit hours uh, for course number 5266. That's 5266. Okay, today's speakers are Joelle DeVere, an attorney and member of the National Data Privacy and Cybersecurity Group at McDonald Hopkins Law Firm. Joelle advises organizations on data privacy and cybersecurity risks. This includes compliance with state and federal data breach notification laws and incident response strategies and management. Joelle has counseled clients through hundreds of data breaches and privacy incidents, working closely with forensic investigators, third-party vendors, and local, state, and federal law enforcement, while at the same time minimizing the exposure for her clients. Uh, Esteban Farrell is a director of IT security consulting at ERM Protect Cybersecurity Solutions here in Coral Gables. Uh, the firm was founded in 1998 and provides vulnerability assessments, IT security audits, digital forensics, incident response, and other cybersecurity solutions to about 400 clients and 35 industry verticals. Esteban's been in cybersecurity for quite a while, 25 years. He's investigated dozens of data breach incidents, identifying the cause of the attacks and assisting clients to contain them. He is an expert in IT security and advises clients on how to fortify their defenses and secure their IT infrastructure. Uh, Esteban is very uh, is a veteran of the industry. He's got 11 uh, security certifications, uh, including a certification by the Payment Card Industry Security Council to assess compliance with payment card security requirements, known as a PCI QSA, and to investigate credit card breaches, known as a PCI PFI. Hang on a second, hang on everybody, the slides aren't moving. Next, next slide, there you go, thank you. Trouble with the mouse. Quickly, an overview of today's agenda. Esteban will talk about how to protect your organizations from ransomware and what to do if attacked. And Joelle will talk about the latest trends in ransomware and legal considerations in deciding whether to pay ransomware. And again, if you have any questions during the presentations, just uh, click the Q&A button and we'll get to those at the end. A quick disclaimer, of course, today's information is not legal advice, should not be considered as such, it's just for informational and educational purposes. With that, I'll turn it over to Esteban. Uh, thank you, Judy. Uh, could you please uh, move this slide because I'm not seeing. Hang on, we have a little technical glitch here. There you go. Okay, now we are good. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's start this presentation by taking a look at the 2020 data, 2020 data breach picture. Uh, this information was taken by reviewing security breaches that happened to 524 different companies with, from different industries between August 2019 and April 2020. <clears throat> As you can see, the situation is not really good. The average cost of the data breach is $3.86 million. And move to the, to the remote world due to the COVID-19 has added $137,000 to the cost of this breach. 
the average number of data I take from the from the moment that the bridge is identified and, and is contained is around 280 days. About 50% of the bridges were financially motivated and 80% exposed sensitive personal identifier information. It was also estimated that by 2021, on average, every 11 seconds, a new organization will be victim of ransomware attack and the damage will be around $20 billion. Uh, next, please. Thanks. Um, the scope of this problem is huge and it's affected multiple uh, industries around the world. Um, I'm sure you all read about the attack on the software company Caseya, which affected between 800 and 2,000 small businesses and is potentially making the largest ransomware attack ever. Uh, in May, Colonia, Colonia Pipeline was also attacked, stopping the gas supply uh, for the entire uh, East Coast and the company paid $4.4 million. GBS was also a victim of ransomware attack and the company paid $11 million to get the world's largest meat processing plant back online. Now, the legal industry is not immune to this type of attacks. The security research firm Cogware has reported that in Q1, 24.9% of the ransomware attacks target professional services firms, especially small and mid-sized law firms. Uh, one big takeaway of this data is that in the ransomware attack, the information or the data is not just encrypted, but also stolen. So once you are hit by ransomware, your entire infrastructure is compromised and you cannot trust it anymore. It means it's, it's not just one machine that was hit, but all the, all the different devices that are connected to it. Now, hackers are doing this for money, so trusting them that they are going to keep the side of the bargain once you pay the ransom is a fallacy. Next, please. Now, the great question to ask at this point uh, is why ransomware is so prolific and why ransomware work? Next. That web is one of the, the main reasons for the proliferation of all these forms of malware and ransomware. What you can see here is how the internet looks like. So you have the first the first part is the surface web or the visible web, where that's where everybody goes on every day. Then you have the deep web. Those are websites where the URL or the address is very difficult to find because they are no index. You cannot find them through Google or Yahoo. And then you have the dark web, which is the invisible part of the internet is where everyone remains anonymous and precisely the best place to sell this type of malicious programs. In order to gain access to the dark web, you need to have a special browser. I will show you in the, in the next slide what you can see in the dark web. Next, please. What you have here is an example of an app that you can find in the, in the dark web. Here there, are, there is a ransomware for sale for only $39. So the only thing it has to do is just click a button and make a payment using cryptocurrency like uh, Bitcoin, and that's it you have a, a ransomware software. Now, if you read the headline, it says FUD, which means fully undetectable. This means that this specific uh, ransomware cannot be detected by the, all the uh, antivirus that you have in the market right now. And if you continue reading, it says full lifetime license, which means that in this case, the seller offer you some so sort of software support if for any reason your ransomware is detected by an antivirus, they can help you to make it fully undetectable again. Now, let's try to put this in real life perspective. A kid in, in, the, in the high school could buy this ransomware and target several uh, people and get money of it. Now, if we replace that kid for someone, for anyone who has financial problems or needs money to survive, then the probability that this attack will happen increases exponentially. And if we do some numbers, the attacker investment is only $39 for a software that can be distributed as many times as, as he wants. So if we consider the money that he can collect from ransoms around the world, then the return on investment is incredible. And that is why ransomware attack works. What you have here, it's a, 
another way to get a, a ransomware uh, application. In this case, this is a hacker website where the only thing that you have to do is just to put the amount of ransom that you want to collect. Uh, they know that it's going to be displayed at the victim, and that's it. You click the button create, and the hacker take care of the rest. In this type of model, 70% of the ransom payment uh, that you are going to receive is for you, and the remaining 30% is going to be for the hacker. What is important to understand here is that you don't really need to have any technical knowledge to launch a, a ransomware attack. Next. Another type of business offering is ransomware as a service. Um, as all you need to do is just to connect to the dark web, create a, an account in this type of site, and that's it, you are ready to go. And this is the most common type of services that they are opening right now in, in the dark web. Uh, what you see here is, a, is like a typical sales dashboard where the client in this case are going to be all the different individuals or organizations that they were affected by the, your ransomware. Then you're going to have the number of payments that you receive, number of Bitcoins that you earn, and also they give you, you know, the today's Bitcoin conversion rate in, in dollars, at least in this case. Again, and if, if this is really important to remember is no technical knowledge is needed. Once you, you only thing needs to gain access to the dark web, pay for this platform, and then if you click, you are a ransomware hacker. Next, please. Just to summarize, this is slide show you all the different, the, the entire process how that works. We have a ransomware coder or hacker who create a ransomware and use it, using the, uh, the Tor network they put it on sales in the dark web. Then we have the ransomware buyer that acquired the, the, the software using one of the methods I mentioned, I mentioned before. And then he released it to the, the, the individuals or organizations. Now the victims need to pay for the, the data back uh, using cryptocurrency or even to release the services. Um, on the other hand, the hackers get paid depending on the model that the buyer use, again, using cryptocurrency. It is, as you can see, it is a very well-planned model where the entire chain makes money while keeping the criminal anonymous. Next, please. One question that you might have at this point is, how big is the dark web and the Tor network that allow all this? And the answer is pretty big. Uh, there are 2.4 million of users connected to the Tor network on a given time. And the Tor network has about 6,500 relays and 1,800 breaches, which these are all the different servers that allow you to connect from the visible web to the dark web. On average, there are 175,000 dot onion addresses in the dark web, which are the equivalent of dot com addresses in the visible internet. And in the past month, uh, Tor browser has received on average 500,000 requests for patches updates. Uh, so we can assume that's the number of Tor browsers deployed around the world. And this is one of those uh, applications I told you that you need to have in order to, ask, to, uh, uh, to gain access to the dark web. Next, please. Okay, thank you, Esteban. Um, our next uh, speaker, Joel Devere, is an attorney at McDonald Hopkins. He's going to talk about current trends in ransomware, the legal uh, implications of paying ransomware, and your obligations as a, a Florida attorney. When she finishes, Esteban will come back in and speak about specific strategies to combat ransomware. And then again, finally, we'll wrap up with that Q&A session. So do please send your uh, questions in. Joelle? Sure, thank you, Judy and Esteban. So we'll get started just by talking a little bit about the different trends we're seeing regarding the victims in the industry. So we, we've seen a significant increase in attacks in certain industries, and these include the industries listed here. So that's healthcare, managed service providers. Those can be your, you know, those IT companies that a lot of different companies use like Kaseya, manufacturing, municipalities, professional service providers. That includes accountants, lawyers, like you all listening today, uh, education, so that can be school districts or universities, and some financial institutions like banking institutions. Um, you may be wondering why would the threat actors be interested in, you know, me, I'm a solar practitioner, or I have a small firm. That's actually a main target. So we really have been seeing an increase uh, in attacks on small and mid-sized businesses. 
perhaps the threat actors think, you know, the defenses may not be quite as high, it, you know, maybe there's not as much to invest there compared to multinational corporations. Uh, but whatever the reason, we definitely see and, and represent a lot of clients that are small and mid-sized businesses. So that's just something to know. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, perfect. There. Um, the attack vector and variants have not changed much over the years. So the main attack vectors are still email phishing and RDP compromise. So email phishing is you give up your credentials and someone gets into your account. RDP compromise can actually stem from email phishing. So someone may be able to get into your account um, and then kind of hop over onto your main network and, and release the ransomware, or they could just come in through your uh, misconfigured RDP portal, especially as people are working remotely and get in that way. The biggest change that I've seen and, and the industry has seen in the last couple of years with ransomware is this exfiltration component. It used to be three years ago that when you got hit with ransomware, all the ransomware did was lock up your files and you weren't able to access them. Now it's it's a different ball game. In I, I think the latest statistic I saw over the weekend from Coveware, the same security research firm that Esteban mentioned earlier, they are saying that 81% of the ransom attacks that they're seeing include data exfiltration, which is that the threat actors are coming and taking a copy of your data first. And that really changes the dynamics of a ransom situation. So, you know, depending on what type of information was impacted, if there's protected information for your clients or for your company, you may have some notif notification obligations to individuals or regulators. You also may be more inclined in a way to pay a ransom, right? You're saying, oh, well, maybe if I pay, uh, they won't release that data on the dark web. So it really changed up the discussion a little bit where you used to be able to just restore from backup and you know kind of go on your merry way right you you were sort of done with the incident you put it behind you and with this new data exfiltration component it's made it a little bit more complicated to analyze and we first saw this exfiltration with the maze variant but now there are a lot of different copycat groups that when they steal that data they post it up to the dark web which is often called a shame site and people are able to come and, and visit those sites and see what in uh, organizations were attacked and what data was posted. Um, so like I mentioned, a lot of these events now are considered breaches under the law. I have that in quotation marks because it's it's a legal, um, that word has legal significance. You know, if you've got an incident, it may not be a breach requiring some type of notification, but a lot of these exfiltration events are breaches now that require notification. And another thing we've seen, just so you all are aware, is that there are some hasty threat actors in, in the industry that have been deleting data. And that is a newer thing that has um, come in the last quarter or two. It still is not happening too often, but that's all the more reason why you wanna make sure you've got good backups. Next slide, please. So sort of to the meat of this, is it legal to pay ransomware? Um, it depends. I'll answer like any good lawyer. There really is no state or federal law prohibiting payment. But what we've got is some guidance from OFAC. So that's the Department of Treasury. Um, and they issued guidance in October of last year that really went through their analysis on this issue. And at the time they issued the guidance, there were tons of news articles that came out saying it's illegal to pay ransomware. You know, you're not allowed to do it anymore. And that really was not what they said. And in fact, when I've been to seminars recently hearing FBI agents speak, they, they confirm that. They understand that some businesses have to pay ransom because because they know there's no other way for them to transact business. And, and they don't wanna be in a position where they're forcing businesses, especially smaller businesses, to close because they're the victims of ransomware. So that's something to keep in mind. They do understand that some businesses are gonna be in a position where they have to pay or else they'll have to close their doors. Um, and another thing the FBI agent said in a recent seminar I listened to was they really don't wanna make the victims bad days worse. What they want to do is sh you know, share information. They want to catch these bad guys. And the more you're able to work with the FBI by giving them indicators of compromise or Bitcoin wallet information, the more it goes, they're able to go off of that and try to catch the threat actors. So that OFAC guidance did say certain things that are important that I wanted to go through today. 
The first was, if you pay individuals on their sanctions list, um, you will be opening yourself up to sanctions. That's a possibility. The thing with that list is it is very comprehensive overall, but not very comprehensive with respect to ransomware. Uh, meaning that these groups change their shape so frequently, these bad guys are associated with so many different ransomware gangs that it's almost impossible to keep up. So when you look at that list, that sanctions list, you're only going to see a handful of ransomware groups. So like I've got an example of the Evil Corp, Lazarus Group, those are a couple that are listed on that um, sanctions list. And if you decide you have to make a payment to them as a business decision, you are opening yourself up to, to sanctions. So that's something to know. They also say that you, you possibly have strict liability. So if you don't check that list and you decide you're going to make a payment um, and the entity is on that list, you can be held strictly liable. So you always want to make sure to take a look at that list. Um, another, another guideline they gave is that entities that are making the payments on your behalf must be registered money service businesses and need to file appropriate suspicious activity reports. So that is you need to be working with the right team if you're going to facilitate that ransom payment. Um, and lastly, they strongly encourage disclosure to law enforcement. The main group that works with um, these types of issues is the FBI. And what I'll say is whether you want to notify the FBI generally about some type of ransomware incident is, is up to you and your counsel. But if you are making a payment, the OFAC guidance says you should report it to the FBI as soon as possible. And even beforehand, if you're able to, and if not that same day, because that will be considered in mitigation, if you end up accidentally paying someone who is on that list or who is later added to that list. So it's just about being upfront with the FBI and letting them know that you are going to be making that payment. Next slide, please. Um, so here are some non-legal considerations, right? These are just different things to think about if you have to go through this analysis of whether you're going to pay the ransom. Um, I'll consider that first issue there more of a threshold issue. Do you have cyber insurance? If you do, you may have coverage for a ransom payment and some of these other components that go along with the forensic investigation, legal notifications. So you always want to know your coverage and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, viability of backups. How long will it take to restore? That's a huge component here. Do you even have viable backups? If not, your other option is going to be to rebuild. Um, and that could take a long time and use up a lot of resources, both from a financial standpoint and from, um, you know, in an in individual standpoint, right? It's, it's really going to take a lot of work to rebuild your system. And if you can't do one of those two things, then you, your third option is to pay the ransom, right? So these are the different analysis that goes through. Um, it's also worth noting that business interruption costs play into this. And what I mean by that is how long are you going to be unable to transact business? So if you're a lawyer listening today, you may have paper copies of some files. You may say, hey, I can still write that motion. I can still file that brief on someone else's computer. Maybe you're able to transact business. So you've got a little bit more wiggle room about how long it will take you to get back up, up and running. But if you're a car dealership and you can't sell any cars for two weeks or three weeks, that, that average of downtime there you see is 21 days, um, you're losing out on a lot of money. So at some point, some businesses are put in a position where they have to quantify how much money they're losing per day and compare that to a ransom amount and say, hey, when is it financially advantageous to us to pay that ransom amount? Um, because at the end of the day, we, we want to keep our doors open. So those are some other um, things to consider. And if you are going to pay a ransom, most of my clients are able to negotiate that ransom down. The percentage depends on the particular threat actor group, but that's something to note that if you're in a position where you are having these discussions with the threat actor group, you'll want to consider um, negotiating that ransom down. Next slide, please. Um, like I mentioned before, the exfiltration piece has changed this conversation quite a bit. So if data has been taken, is it sensitive? Do you have legal obligations relating to it? That may play into your analysis of whether you're going to pay a ransom. What I'll say is we've seen in the industry that um, the threat actor groups that are exfiltrating data often share that data anyways. So typically I would caution my clients against paying a ransom just to keep that data secure and hopefully not post it up to the dark web because we're seeing it shared anyways in the vast majority of times. 
Um, you'll want to know the reputation and history of the threat actor group. So you, a lot of these threat actor groups operate like businesses, surprisingly. They've got um, you know, customer service hours. They've got really well um, regulated businesses in a way. And the reason is because their, their word, even though they're criminals, is why people pay. So if they have a reputation for not uh, sending a decryption key, they're not going to get paid. So they try to keep it running more like a machine and they try to keep their reputation, as funny as that sounds, um, you know, as sparkly as possible. So there are statistics that some of these security firms compile uh, and you can say, hey, I got hit with this uh, threat actor group's ransomware. Tell me about them. Do they normally give the decryption key? Does it usually work? Do they ever come back and attack uh, the same victim again? These are different things to consider as well. Those, those reputation and history of the threat actor group. And lastly, hopefully it's, it's not as much of an issue on the, uh, for the people listening to the call today, but threat to human life does come into play sometimes. And I think we're gonna see that more and more. Um, you know, it's come into play when hospitals have gotten hit or healthcare systems, when they're not able to treat their patients, they're in the middle of surgery and their machines go down, right? That's something you may have to consider if that's some, uh, something that applies in your field. And again, something I think we're gonna see more of, unfortunately. Next slide. And um, the, the role of cyber insurance here can be important. What I'll say is hopefully most of the people that are on this call today have some type of cyber insurance, whether that's through your ENO policy, whether that is a separate cyber policy. Um, it exists uh, for, for good reason and can really help you if you get hit by an attack. And not only ransomware, it can help you when you get hit by an email compromise. Uh, it, it can help you in all kinds of different circumstances that fall under your policy. And so that's why it's important to know your coverage and to say, hey, you know, I've got, I know I've got coverage for legal, forensic, a ransom payment, but it's subject to these limitations. Do I only have $10,000 for forensics or legal? Um, does my policy not kick in till $50,000 is spent out of pocket? I've really seen policies that run the gamut. So it's important to know from a financial standpoint what your business can tolerate while also making sure that you have the coverage that, that will help serve you in the event that you are a victim of this type of attack. Um, another thing to note is that these premiums are going up. Aon, who, who's a big broker in this space, has estimated that increased rates will we'll see about 20 to 50 percent this year. Um, not really surprising because I think that the industry, the cyber insurance industry, didn't envision this many high dollar ransom payments that they would be paying out on, and they're still trying to catch up to that. Next slide. And I'll just wrap up my, my little discussion by talking about some of the rules that are in place. So if you're a Florida lawyer, what should you be thinking about? What are your obligations here? So um, we've got rule 4-1.6 in the comments. It deals with confidentiality of information. It says lawyers must competently safeguard client information. Um, unauthorized access to information does not constitute a violation if the lawyer has made reasonable efforts to prevent the access or disclosure. So we've got a little bit of a safeguard there built into the rules. Are you making reasonable efforts to prevent the access or disclosure? That's something you wanna be thinking about. And Esteban will talk a little bit more about what those efforts could be in a second. Um, and they also say whether a lawyer may be required to take additional steps is beyond the scope of these rules. Um, that's an interesting statement. What they're saying is we don't really want to touch data breaches specifically in these rules. We are going to fall back on Florida state law. Florida state law is reactive. Florida state law says this is what you have to do when you have a data breach, meaning you have Florida residents uh, information impacted that is protected under the statute, like social security numbers, bank account information, credit card information, um, health information. There are a few different categories. So they say, we, we're not going to get involved and add more to those requirements, but you really need to know what your requirements are under Florida law if you've got a breach. Next slide. And one more thing, the ABA has issued a formal opinion that is directly on the point of a breach. They did say that you wanna keep your clients reasonably informed. Um, and also they, they noted that you've got a duty to notify and take reasonable steps when a data breach occurs, involving or having a substantial likelihood of involving material client information. If you're a lawyer, there's probably a lot of words we can argue are a little ambiguous there and what do they mean, like reasonable or substantial likelihood or material client information. Um, 
And so I think what governs all of this is how would you want to be treated? It goes back sort of to the golden rule. If your information was impacted in a breach, um, would you want to be notified? So that's something I think you should keep in mind if you are the, the victim of some type of incident and you're considering whether you should notify your clients, you definitely should look to the Florida law and any other state laws that may uh, apply because it's really governed by where those impacted individuals live. But at the end of the day, you should think about what's, what's right in the scenario as well. Great. Thank you, Joelle. Next, uh, to wrap up the session, Esteban is going to talk about what to do uh, if you are attacked. And um, just so we end on a hopeful note, uh, he's also going to talk about ways you can protect uh, your law firm or your organization. Esteban? Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Uh, next. There you go. So uh, you are on the attack of the ransomware. So the big question is what you do. Um, what I'm going to tell you is that a couple of things that your IT personnel should do in these situations. First of all, iso isolate the machine. You need to disconnect the infected machine from the network. And if there are multiple machines, you can, what you can do is segment it out so you can restrict the infection. Kill off communications. There are many ransomware that they need to connect back to what they call command and console server, which they call C2 server to get the, the, the encryption key. So if you are able to cut that communication channel by isolating your network from the internet, you could potentially prevent that the ransomware be fully executed and you can save a lot of information in the infected machines. Now, one thing that you need to take in consideration since your network is being compromised is that hackers could be inside and watching whatever, everything that you are doing. So your internal incident response team needs to use what they call autobahn method of communication, which means that they cannot use their regular business email. They can use, for example, their personal email or use text messages because you are, you are risking that the hackers know what they are doing. Um, block IP addresses, no, the ransomware need to communicate back to the C2 server. So these type of ransomware are self-sufficient, so they know what needs to be done inside the network. In the way that ransomware usually works is they, once they compromise one machine, they start to scan internally, looking for more targets, more machines, and try to exploit vulnerabilities. So your, uh, uh, your IT service provider uh, needs to be able to analyze the traffic and detect that type of communication so they can stop the propagation. Now, once you are able to identify what type of ransomware is hitting your environment, you, uh, you need to go uh, uh, the previous side, but anyway. So once you, you already get hit by the ransomware, you need to look online if you can find the decryption keys. Uh, this is important. There is one specific website called No More uh, Ransom Project that was created by the different antivirus companies where they centralize all the different tools to the crypt files that are encrypted by ransomware. Now next. Secure backups and, and systems that hold backup data, especially if they are connected to the network. Though you need to make sure that those devices are isolated and they are not infected. You know, the ransom, in the way that ransomware was I explained before, they try to propagate in the network. If you have your backups connected to your network, they can potentially encrypt those files. Now, you also need to prevent, uh, preserve the, the log files that you have right now. You might not have the decryption key now, but they might be later published online by a security research company. Now, if your uh, server is a virtual machine server and it was compromised, then you can take a snapshot. In this way, if your recovery plan doesn't work, you can get the things back to the point that you started and try again. Additionally, if for any reason you need to do a forensic investigation, you can use that, you can use that snapshot. Next. If your backup are handed and they are not infected and, and, and you can access there immediately, start the restore, restore the restoring process using a different machine. You also need to calculate how much data have you lost, how long it's going to take to restore it and how long is it, how it's going to impact your business. Uh, remember that sometimes you can find out uh, information from the different places, 
like an email or external hard disk or even temporary files. The process might be a little bit tedious, but at least it's going to reduce the impact in your organization. Now, if you are able to restore machines, you also need to make sure that they are not infected. And running antivirus scan alone is not going to be sufficient. You also need to go there and manually check what processes are running in the computer to see if there is something suspicious. Additionally, you need to change all the passwords for the different applications and systems. And finally, uh, you need to have in your incident response plan the contact information of the local field office of the FBI or secret services as well employees or the organization that provide legal counsel in case that you need to contact uh, the law enforcement. Next, please. So much more important than what you do during the cyber attack is the preparation that you do before it. These are a kind of tips, the things that you need to do to prepare yourself. Security awareness training, uh, we are the weakest link. And uh, so that is why it's so important that you need to train your personnel or your employees on cyber security, especially to recognize phishing attacks. And the training material should be easy to understand and must be include some guidance uh, to identify and report those type of uh, suspicious activities. Due to the COVID-19 situation, employees are working remotely. So you need to implement a virtual private network solution to extend your internal network across the public network. The VPN solution will ensure that the information that you are going to transfer to your internal network is protected and secure. However, VPN solutions are, all, are also software and those software needs to be maintained with the latest version that they are in the market and also needs to be properly configured. When you implement the VPN, you also need to take in consideration that your internal network got, gets not exposed to the internet. When we talk about a strong authentication, uh, we are talking about multi-factor authentication. And this is the type of authentication that requires to use at least two factors to recognize you. Factors are something you know, like if you said in a password, uh, something that you have like a crypto, a crypto device or soft token, uh, something that you are like a biometric fingerprint, uh, and somewhere you are, could be Florida, you're connected from Florida, or your IP addresses. It is recommended to use multi-factor authentication to all the service to the extent as possible, especially webmail, VPNs, and accounts that they have access to critical information or accounts that they have a lot of privileges, like admin accounts. And regarding to the access controls, you need to apply the least uh, privilege to all the, the systems. So which means that the user needs to have all the accesses that they need to uh, just to complete their, their job, no more than that. So for example, in my case, I could be the administrator by the same time I'm a user. So I could have two accounts. One account just to do my mundane stuff, reading emails, go to the internet. But when I need to do something, I can switch to my other account that is with administrative privileges. In that way, if something happened to my computer, then I would minimize the impact. Then vulnerability scans are automated tools that they constantly update with vulnerabilities, signatures, and patterns. So they can help you to identify address vulnerabilities in your network. You need to do conduct vulnerabilities scans on a regular basis, especially to those devices that are connected to the internet. Next one, please. You need to make sure that you regularly patch and update your software and operating system with all the latest available version. And this is also applicable to your antivirus and, and malware, anti malware they need to have the signatures up to date. For this specific type of thread, backups are, are key. So you need to have a good backup process and test it regularly. So some of the business that are hit by ransomware have fully uh, recovered things that they have a good backups. And again, you need to remember that there are some ransomware that they are also target backup file. So you need to keep an offline backup copy as well. And finally, you need to have an incident response plan. I mean, you can use the guidance from the NIST, the National Institute for Standard Technology as a foundation. The idea of the plan needs to have as a minimum 
all the different type of cyber incident that your organization could have, and all the detailed procedures that you need to to do in, in order to respond and mitigate the threat. The idea is to have a very actionable action plan, and when the task, something happens, you don't need to think a lot of what I need to do next. You already have the recipe and the entire list of things that needs to be done. Next. Uh, the next uh, two slides, uh, this one and, and the next one, I have included some references that I could help you to better understand some of the controls uh, I shall discuss and also references to several government sites related to a ransomware. Thank you very much, Esteban. Now uh, we're going to open up for questions. Uh, several have already been answered in the chat, uh, but I'll repeat one of them, which was, what does RDP mean, Esteban? Uh, RDP is a protocol, is the remote, remote exo protocol that Microsoft use uh, for, usually used for the administrator to gain access to the computer. So when you are uh, remotely. So since you are not physically, they give you the same look and feel as if you were connected physically to the computer. And that's uh, most of the ransomware, are, are, as uh, Joel mentioned, they are targeting that protocol because it has a lot of uh, vulnerabilities. And one of the things I mentioned for the VPN connection is that if you need to use RDP for whatever reason, you need to have a VPN connection and then use RDP encapsulated. And if you implement the, uh, the VPN not properly, you are going to expose the RDP to internet and then you can potentially get compromised. Most people probably know what a VPN is, but just um, in case. Uh, can that's, you... that's the virtual private network. Is that the software that you use uh, when you try to, you try to extend your internal network across the public network. So they create like a tunnel. It's like a tube where whatever information that you send through that tube, that, that channel is going to be encrypted and protected. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joelle, uh, how often are victim organizations hit again with ransomware uh, after payment? Uh, the questioner has seen figures of 80% in other articles or presentations. Yeah, so I mean, I can answer from my perspective of handling, you know, four or 500 breaches uh, or cyber incidents. I would say not too often. I think from my, from my perspective, a lot of times when I see those figures, I think it, it can be a little bit of a scare tactic. So hopefully that's a little bit of reassurance where if you're in this scenario um, and you are having to make a payment, I very rarely see a reattack. And that is the one good thing if you're working with a vendor who facilitates those payments. Um, as, as a business model, which is there are, you know, entities out there who really do this for a living, they will have statistics about the particular threat actor group you were dealing with about how often, if ever, they see a reattack um, relating to the same incident. What I have seen a little bit more frequently is you get attacked, a client gets attacked, they are told to, you know, make their remote desktop protocol more secure, they're told to implement two-factor authentication, they do not. They're subject again a month later or two months later to another ransomware attack. That's what I've seen a little bit more often. It's still relative, relatively rare, but um, and not always by the same threat actor group, by the way. But so it, I would say it's nowhere near 80% from what I see. Um, I'd put it even well below, you know, 10%. It, it's really only happened a couple times that, that I've seen. Great. Uh, this would be also for you, Joel. Are there cases discussing inadequate security or insufficient technology resulting in law firm liability? This question is a good one, and it's still very much in the beginning, I would say. So we're not looking at decades of um, case law on this issue. Because a lot of the statutes are reactive, and when I say a lot, I mean 47 out of 50 US um, you know, state laws are only focused on what you do after a breach, and they're not really implementing what you need to do before. We just don't really have that statutory authority that's easily, um, you're able to point easily and say, uh, this is you know, what you've got to do. This is what's considered reasonable security. There's definitely a lot of discussion in the industry about what reasonable security would look like. I would say from my perspective, if you, if you don't have multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication on your email, put it on right now. That is to me like kind of low hanging fruit that you should be able to implement fairly easily. 
Um, and that's something that I think is part of that security. But um, there, I've seen lawsuits on this issue. I think a lot of them probably get settled out of court and they're based on a general negligence claim typically. So it's just not that easy to state those claims and, and we haven't seen too much of it. So I think we'll start to probably see more, um, but we're still very much in the beginning of that. Okay, great. Stepan, this question is um, for you. You talked a lot about the importance of offline backups, uh, which can't be accessed by hackers. Do you consider offline backups a silver bullet? Uh, no, actually, it's no, an answer, it's no an answer to a ransomware problem, if that's your question. I mean, backup is just a corrective control, is that once you get hit by a ransomware, that is going to help you to restore your business back where you are. I mean, remember that even if you have backup, you are always to lose some information. So from the moment that you get hit and from the moment that you did the backup, that, that period of time, you might not have that, that data anymore. But it's going to help you afterwards, after the attack. Okay, this is also for a step on. Um, I, I know you do a lot of penetration testing, ethical hacking, and so forth, audits, assessments. What are some of the common gaps you see in IT security when testing uh, for vulnerabilities? Um, most of the vulnerabilities that we, we found, they were related to lack of patches, and in some cases, the lack of uh, the implementation of configuration standards. So leaving, uh, you know, it's, the patch is going to be Fix, but the problem that we have the patch is how, how long does it take from the moment that the patch is released and it is implemented in the organization. In a small business that has three or four computers, it may be right away, but in biggest company, it's going to take maybe a month. So that period of time is the, 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 the time of exposure that you can potentially have. Uh, this one's for Joel. Um, how does third party risk play into the ransomware discussion? So you can have the most secure system on the planet and the best employees who will never click on anything. And that's well and good, but you can still be the subject of a ransomware attack via your third party vendor. So that's something to keep in mind. People who, you know, if you use any of those managed service providers, so it could be um, whoever's hosting your, um, your cases, your case files, it can be your, um, trying to think of what other platforms, your time entry software, there are just different ways that this could happen, but it's something to think about. You wanna make sure to the extent you can that the vendors you're working with, those third parties have good security posture. You can do that by asking them questions. You could do it by a more formal questionnaire, um, but you wanna do your due diligence. The other thing I'll say is you want to pay attention to the contracts that you're entering into with these third party vendors. Where that comes up is if they do have an incident like a ransomware attack, um, how long do they have to tell you about that incident? How much do they have to disclose to you about that incident? These are things that are typically contractually governed with your vendors. And um, you know, I'm sure when they hand over their initial contract, it may be very vendor friendly. So you wanna make sure you're comfortable with those provisions if you've got any bargaining power um, or, or wiggle room, right? If it says they have a month to let you know of a security incident, um, and that means that your system is perhaps opened up up to exposure for a month, that's probably not what you want in that contract. But maybe it says something like 24, 48, 72 hours. Um, you know, those may be some provisions that you're able to uh, contract with them. Uh, the other thing is about liability. If they do have a cyber incident um, and, and that trickles down to impact your firm, do they have any liability for it? Um, you know, is it subject to a negligent standard, a gross negligent standard? Uh, just pay attention to those contractual provisions and about what would be limited. So the liability, you know, would it um, cover any forensics you would need to do, any rebuilding, any downtime? Those are other things where you want to have your own cyber insurance to cover these types of things, even these third party events, but you also want to try to protect yourself through those contractual provisions. Okay, I'm going to ask this next question of, of uh, both of you, starting with Esteban. It's a good question. Um, as people are listening to the webinar and wondering what they can be doing immediately afterward to shore up their security. Um, you know, you mentioned two-factor authentication, updating your operating system, uh, do not open unknown emails or downloads, which 
can be taught through security awareness training. A seminar, are there any other uh, cybersecurity protocols besides those that you would recommend? Um, I, I think that those are the most um, critical ones. I mean, what you need to think every time that you want to implement and control in your environment is to determine is how the ransomware can gain access to your network. What, is the, what are the different venues that they can take? So we know that phishing attack is one of the, the, the leaders way that they can get access to your network. So in that sense, everything that we mentioned of uh, don't, op don't open any no email or don't download things that you don't know, that is, or train your employees, that is going to help you. Now, for example, you have the physical access is what happened with the USBs. You connect everybody changing the information using USBs and the USB could potentially be another way that someone can enter a ransomware in your environment. So could be something that you can prevent is who can gain access uh, physically or what type of files they can be downloaded to your computer. Again, access control is important too because the ransomware is going to act with the privileges that, that they have at the time they was infecting the computer now the ransomware then needs to escalate privileges, become admin, just to compromise the rest of the network, exploit vulnerabilities. But if your access control is very tight, meaning that you, for example, I cannot install any software and anything, the probability that ransomware be able to execute in your computer could be minimal. Yes, there is a, the risk is still there. Uh, if there is a new bug or new vulnerability, but you can diminish you know, the, the way that they can propagate in the computer. Joel, anything to add? I, I do. You know, I think Esteban has tackled the technical perspective of this question, and I'll kind of go back to um, maybe more of like the legal or or forced view of this. Think about what data you have, right? You can have the technical components, and they're so important, but also sit down and critically think about what data you're keeping why you're keeping it, do you still need it? There's this um, discussion of data minimization that's really coming to the cyber field. Um, and it is starting to get worked into some laws that we're seeing, and I think we'll see it more so. But if you're holding on to client files that are 10, 20 years old, and you don't need them anymore, get rid of them. Because when you do have an incident, it's going to open yourself up to so much more exposure to the extent that you're going to have to notify a lot more people. And not only are you going to have to notify those people, then the numbers that you're reporting to regulators are going to be higher too, right? Because part of this is, hey, if we have to, the, the law, I know Jonathan put a link to it in the chat, that law says basically if you have to notify over 500 Florida residents about a cyber incident, you also have to notify, notify the Florida Attorney General. When you notify the Florida Attorney General, they're going to say how many Florida residents were impacted. And it makes a difference if that number is 501 or 5,000 or 50,000 or 5 million. Um, they are much more interested in those, those larger number incidents. So you want to keep that in mind. So not only handle these, these important technical components that Espan addressed, but also really think about what data you have. Do you still need it? Who has access to it? And kind of falling back to that conversation about that those, those third party vendors, um, limit their access to data too, if you can, right? You don't want them to have too much access as well. So there, there should just be this underlying discussion of data minimization in your firms um, and in your companies about what you still need to hold on to, because that can really help uh, minimize these incidents when you're dealing with them. Esteban, is, are there, um assessments or penetration testing, limited penetration testing that small law firms can, can use that are affordable or are those things out of the reach of a, of a small business? Uh, I, I believe that performing a scanning, maybe no penetration test because it requires uh, to have also consultants, but vulnerability scanning, they should be affordable. And not really costly. And you can have, obviously, you would need to have someone who understands what are the, the results. But having a, you know, penetration tests have different phases. And one of the phases do a vulnerability scan. Most of the companies are going to do a vulnerability scan anyways. And then they're going to do to the extra mile to try to show you, demonstrate that they can hack you. So if you have only the vulnerability scans, you are going to have a picture of what are the things, the vulnerability or things that they can be. They needs to be fixed. 
if you do a penetration test and you want edit the scan, it goes empty. I assume that the hacker or the company that you could potentially hire, they might not be able to exploit anything. So scan is a reasonable. Okay, great, thank you. One last question, then we'll close it up. Joel, uh, most hacks that we seem to be untraceable. So how does calling law enforcement uh, help? I think that's right. Most of the time we don't know who did the attack in the sense that maybe we can name the threat actor group. Maybe we've got that data, but we don't know who they are. We don't know what country they're located in oftentimes. Um, and I think, you know, there may be a little bit of, I don't know, I don't want to call it confusion or, or anything like that, but the way we saw the FBI handle, and not only the FBI, but whatever other security um, groups were involved with that incident, handled the Colonial Pipeline to the extent that they got back part of the ransom payment, they were able to handle it very quickly, they were super involved. That's not what we see from day to day, at, you know, day to day in this industry and, and attacks, right? If, if a small law firm gets hit, even if you report it to the FBI, state police, typically there, there's just a lack of resources there that they're not going to be able to claw back a ransom payment. Um, and when I say typically, I mean, in my practice, I've never seen it happen. So I was shocked actually to see it happen at the colonial pipeline level, but I think it's amazing. I'm so, you know, so glad they were able to do that, but it's just not often. It still helps at the end of the day, because it's, about aggregating data. It's about connecting the dots between different incidents. And at the end of the day, this information sharing is what will hopefully help bring down ransomware and bring down cyber attacks. Um, you know, the, the, there's one threat actor group that we just saw, the R Evil group. Um, they were uh, the group that was the, the fault of these or ran these big incidents recently that were in the news. Uh, they went dark recently. And I mean, like they disappeared after this attack. And there's, you know, question about whether that was because of pressure from Russia, the US government, they decided to lay low. But look, at least it stopped attacks for a little bit from that one group. Might they reconstitute, form a new group, come back soon? Probably. But it probably stopped a number of attacks. So I would say it helps the information sharing. And, and the more we can do that within the industry, I think at the end of the day, it will help cut down on attacks. So that's why it is typically still worth it, especially if you're going to make a ransom payment or you're negotiating with the threat actors where you've got information like the indicators of compromise or the Bitcoin wallet to share. Um, I'm certainly not saying, and I think it's, it's a, you know, a business decision and something you can discuss with your counsel that you, you want to give like copies of your whole system over, but you can work with the FBI and they understand that a lot of people who are working with them will say, hey, we feel comfortable sharing this amount of information and they will happily take it. They, they want to get as much information about these attacks as possible to help stop them. Um, and oftentimes now they're able to provide you with some information as well. So th those are some considerations there about why um, speaking to law enforcement, um, especially the FBI may still be worth it. Okay, two, there is one last question and I, one announcement is someone asked if the resources that uh, a step on posted would be made available. We'll make sure we send those out to all of the attendees after the session. I'll, I'll get those out probably this afternoon, uh, if not by tomorrow. Um, Esteban, last question. Do we need to use a VPN at home as well, or just when you're outside a secured internet connection, such as working from a coffee shop or another location? Um. You, you need to understand that the only secure network is your company network. So wherever you go, you need to have a VPN. If it is your home, could be a coffee shop, wherever you go, you need to have the VPN. I mean, at your home, you can have your husband or you can have uh, your son that are connected to the network and their computer can be compromised and they can compromise yours. So that's why you need to have a VPN connection. Well, thank you, Esteban and, and Joel. I think we lost Judy there at the end, but you know, thank you both for the great presentation. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope everybody else did as well. Um, and I just posted in the chat for everybody, again, the course number for today was 5266. Um, so if you do want to receive your CLE credit for that, you use code 5266 and post your credits on the Florida Bar website. Um, and we will be uh, making this recording available along with the Stevon's resources and the slides on our website, legalfuel.com. 
So please be looking for that later. And thank you again, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone.